session we have, thank you, um, is we're going to move on to Andrea and Mathilde, if they're ready. Are you ready? <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce them properly. They are Dr. Mathilde Pavis and Dr. Andrea Wallace. Uh, Mathilde is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Exeter. Mathilde's research interests explore legal and ethical issues, so she's very well placed here, related to the protection of individuals, face, body and voice and likeness, as well as the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage, which I hope she's going to dip into explaining a bit, because it's always one of those terms, like most of these things, which I think we have a superficial grasp on but bandy about quite randomly um, and what equitable engagement uh, with this type of content actually looks like in practice. Andrea is also, oh, sorry, hold on, Andrea is also a lecturer and researcher at the University of Exeter and her research explores legal issues around copyright, cultural heritage institutions and the public domain. So between them, they've got all our bases covered and these are your go-to women on these subjects. Um, Andrea frequently writes and presents on open access to cultural heritage and equitable aspects of intellectual property management. Uh, relevant to repatriation of digital and material cultural her heritage. Their work is awesome. If you haven't looked it up and read it, you really ought to. Um, they combine an understanding of the vagaries and limitations of museums and museum practices that I've rarely met in academics, actually, um, and a capacity to unravel the myths and complexities of the law for idiots like me. So their presentation will address how in museum practice the law seems to crystallise a lot of concern, risk aversion and inaction in managing and caring for collections, both physical and digital. So this is where we get to allay our anxieties about this. They'd like to reframe the law in the context of museum practice as something more flexible, which I think really speaks to what um, uh, JC was just saying, you know, how to make her ambition work within an institution, um, that its reputation suggests to show that law is not necessarily a barrier, I'm gonna wait to be convinced, to change in moving towards more ethical and collaborative care for collections. So they're saying if used co creatively, the law can serve as a bridge too. So over to you, Matilda and Andrea, to convince me, but also to give us loads of interesting information. Thank you so much, Nanda, for putting together this event and for those uh, brilliant introductions. And we'll do our best to live up to the high expectations that you've set. Um, so we'll, Andrea and I will try to keep it brief to have as much time as possible for the discussion afterwards and the Q&A. So do feel free to pick up in the chat or even after any terms or points that you'd like us to expand on and sort of re-explain, develop um, and reframe. Uh, we're very happy to do that because I know that we'll be meeting people at different levels of knowledge and experience of uh, law and obviously you will be teaching us about museum practice no doubt so if we uh, go to the next slide um, Andrea's my hand brilliantly so as Ananda explained we want to give you a little bit of hope and sort of frame or see if we can frame law as both a bridge or a barrier for caring in collections when we're moving towards more ethical equitable perhaps collective and collaborative practices around collections very much like um JC's experience at the Horniman uh, and her and the amazing project and toolkit she's developed so what I'm going to do, right. So the reason why we um, start and try to frame the law that way and use the law as our starting point when exploring museum practice and caring for collections is because law, we think, and for us, and feel free to push back against this, is a useful lens to critically reflect on museum practice for us for two main reasons, which we want to discuss today and, and kind of frame our discussion around. The first is that the law can serve as a reminder that curatorial decisions, all of the stuff that we made up, as uh, JC very brilliantly put earlier, all of those curatorial decisions and the materials that are generated for that, uh, for the materials, around the materials themselves, can themselves infringe rights or generate new rights. So just that should give us pause for reflection to think, oh, okay, so if those rights are being made, infringed, generated during this process, there's something about those decisions, this process of caring and curating materials that is not neutral. And of course, you'll know that. Um, and it's something you as practitioners are reflecting on. And just law is a reminder of that. 
um, or I think we think it is. So when we think about the data that is being created routinely, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, because the institution's processes requires that, uh, and that indeed is a part of the normal curatorial practice, that um, the particularities of the institution you're working in um, will dictate, we may think that those decisions, this data that's being generated has little impact to decision making. And then actually when you bring the law and when the law is tracking how it handles, streets, protects this data, it kind of serves as a reminder. So that's kind of what we mean by this. So the law and the way it recognizes rights and who owns them is, um, kind of useful to rethink about those decisions, those acts, those processes, institutional, individual, or community-based as not neutral and having an impact, even if there may be a routine to um, the practitioners or the staff working within the institution. So what data you collect, how you collect it, what data you create about an object, how you structure that data or metadata into a data set, into your collection management system, into your records management system, how many documents you include or not, in what format, in what resolutions, if there are images, for example, all of these seemingly mundane decisions may have an implication in law. And that we want you to think about those implications as a reminder to reflect and think as the practice as not necessarily neutral towards the object in the community that uh, the objects may be kind of belonging to or um, connected to. But I don't want you to think about that as a source of anxiety, as a source of concern, or as a source for, or a reason not to be doing something, a cause for inaction, for example. And that brings me to the second point, and I hope, Ananda, I'm going to bring you on board with let's think of the law as a reminder, but not a source of anxiety, as a potential bridge, but not always as a barrier. Because law in the context of museum practice can be a source of mythology. Um, and to an extent, actually, a source of anxiety, a source of concern, when it's framed especially as a barrier to action or doing what's right, as opposed to um, a tool within your arsenal to support your work as a heritage practitioner or as a community member uh, working with heritage uh, institutions. So when I talk about mythology, I don't mean to convey any idea or connotation of ignorance or of inaccurate knowledge of law. Uh, law is a very complex area of knowledge it uses very often, if not almost exclusively inaccessible language and has concepts that don't really make sense unless you have been working in it and have been trained in it. Um, and what I mean by mythology here is that it's actually really interesting how um, and the way in which the language of law lands in museum practice and how it is shaped or how it's being reused by uh, heritage uh, practitioners. For example, words like rights, like legal liabilities, infringement even, contract, intellectual property, copyright, and so forth. All of these terms that I'm sure you'll be familiar with because you've used them, you've encountered them, not often in a good way, and often is that you can't do this because rights, because legal liabilities. Uh, all of these words and this language will have informed and shaped your decisions. Um, and I may add that it's actually rarely that you will have encountered those words or used them or have to make decisions um, in a welcome way, right? There are things that are often you had to consider and take care of or find a solution or work around uh, for that may have slowed down or may, may have meant that you haven't done what you wanted to do with the collections or been as collaborative as you'd have liked to be. And I think this is where the mythology comes from because we seem, and I include very much lawyers in this, we think um, and that we collectively frame the law as something that um, is a barrier or something when we choose to focus or we focus on the parts where the law limits and prevents certain decisions, certain actions, certain projects. Uh, but technically, we could also have it, um, see it the other way around and have a different approach where we engage with the law for its flexibilities and for the things it has to offer, as opposed to just viewing it as a barrier to action, as a barrier to the work that you want to do. Now, I know that's a tall order, right? So I'm not saying we'll be able to get there instantly and, and uh, immediately. However, we could leverage more of the flexibility than the barrier, which is where we're going with this and trying to frame it as more of a possibility for a bridge than for a barrier to collaborative, ethical, equitable work. 
Um, so we'd like you to, for this reason, we'd like you to leave you with a little bit more hope than anxiety when we're thinking about working with the law in the context of museum practice because the law can be challenged and shaped by your practice. The law is as much of a social construct made up thing as your collection is. Now, of course, we are not legislators, so we do have to work within whatever boundaries that our legislators and even our institutions have uh, understood the law to mean, right? But this doesn't mean that on the ground level, there isn't flexibilities for you to uh, challenge and work with the law in a more creative way uh, to suit um, your curatorial practice, especially if you're going down the route or trying to go down the route of more collaborative, decentralized approach to collection. And the law is more flexible and can be your ally is our second point. And especially there are areas within the law that contracts can come in and be very, very useful. And I will agree that it does take a level of knowledge of the law, but I think what is more important than the knowledge or equally important to the knowledge is the mindset. Trying to frame it not as a barrier, but as something I can mold, shape and work with, because you can absolutely do that um, and let your curatorial decision dictate how you're going to work with the law as opposed to the other way around as much as you can. Um, I know it's a tall order, but I do want us to have and set those standards, not for ourselves, but perhaps for our institution to find a solution within the law as opposed to be hit by the barrier. So that's what I would like you to keep in mind for sort of the rest of our presentation and discussion, push back as hard as you'd like, and we're very happy to do that. Before I hand over to Andrea, I'm just gonna use the next slide to, um, bring it to a little bit more concrete than just talking about the law, because what does that mean, right? So I would like to give you some concrete examples of what we mean when uh, we are referring to law being a barrier or a bridge in caring for collections. So I'm sure you'll know that many areas of law will come into play in uh, your practice as a heritage practitioner or uh, in your engagement as a museum community, um, a member, sorry, as a member of the uh, community. We couldn't name them all here and we will not be able to cover them all here. Uh, but the ones that you're likely to have in mind that probably the most sort of prevalent and prominent in the practice would be property rights, especially if you're looking at uh, physical items, copyright and intellectual uh, and other intellectual property rights like performance rights and database rights. Um, and that's something we'll touch upon in the second part. Contracts, obviously, because participant even engagement into events, workshop where they create is often negotiated or recorded or captured through contracts. And data protection is also uh, an important one, especially in countries like the UK and throughout the EU that recognize strong uh, personal data protection rights or regulation. There may be others that apply, of course, especially if you're uh, working for a public institution or with a public institution, then there may be specific regulations that apply if you're working with public archives, etc. Um, so for what follows and for when I hand over to Andrea in a minute, we will mainly focus on digital materials and digital collections, which should fit neatly with the conversation we've had with JC uh, that uh, with an agent just now. And the reason why we focus on digital materials or digital co collections, it's because um, that seems to compound a lot of legal challenges and opportunities. And it make for it just make the problems and opportunities more obvious and therefore a bit perhaps easier for us to discuss and easier for us to keep in the concrete and the practical, especially for a Q&A. So we'll use digital collections as the illustration of this notion that law can be both a barrier and a bridge. So I want to leave you with one more twist before I pass on to Andrea. And that twist is, because I know it's not complicated enough as it is, that twist is when, is when thinking about law as a barrier or a bridge, uh, we often think about the presence of law, right? We have rights that exist or that are somehow recognized in this particular country and we have to respect them and there are challenge or opportunity. But the thing is, it's not always the presence of the law, the presence of rights that make your practice difficult. It can also be the absence of rights or the absence of law that generates uh, potential sort of ethical issues or inequities. And we have that in particular when rights are, or content is 
not protected or falls within the public domain, often when we hear that, we're like, hooray, no laws, no rights, let's go, we can do whatever we want, we have the freedom to be ethical in a way that will best suit our community, our institution, the situation at hand. But then sometimes actually the absence of law is not necessarily meaning sort of removing all of the barriers. So it really is a game of um, thinking about all ends of the law as it applies to your collection. And I think the bridge is possible. The barrier is very present, we're really aware of it, but the bridge is possible. So I'm going to close on this. And this was my setup to Andrea's sort of um, illustrations and examples of this, what this looked like in practice. So I am now handing over to Andrea. Thanks, Matilde. Um, so I'm gonna pick up with this kind of idea of what the public domain is, and especially because um, in collections management, we're so often uh, trained to assume that things are in copyright, assume that things are protected by rights, which then um, you know, creates this, this understanding that there's something to prevent us um, from, from working with an object, from digitizing, from doing certain things, which very much may be the case. Um, but that's also a concept that is often embedded in copyright law because the understanding is that as soon as something is created, it is protected by copyright. It's an automatic protection um, that the creator will enjoy during their lifetime and then their heirs for an additional 70 years. And while that is the case, there are still legal requirements that have to be met in order for copyright to arise. So, you know, this applies to data, it applies to the arrangement of data, it applies to data sets, it applies to digital images, it applies to analog images, it applies to the work itself. Um, so actually what we're gonna do is kind of reposition around the idea that everything by default is in the public domain because that's actually the more accurate response of the law. And then if materials meet the legal requirements for protection, they receive a protection. But I wanna focus on this idea about the public domain being default and what that includes. So we have materials that cannot be protected as a matter of law like ideas or non-original works. So these are works that don't meet the threshold of creativity or even you know, novelty for thinking about patents, um, but things that are very relevant to data collection and museum management, like short phrases, facts, numbers, descriptive data, things that get embedded in metadata and even paradata around how uh, a digital object is created. Um, we then have materials that predate IP laws. So creative works that were made before copyright protection existed or was extended to that specific subject matter. Um, we also have faithful reproductions of these works, uh, things that are seen as copies and so therefore not worthy of their own copyright in and of themselves. But then I have a few other very broad areas of subject matter that may or may not predate IP laws, like traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions or intangible cultural heritage. And because these are different types of uh, works and creative works that um, do not fit neatly within the intellectual property system, a system that uh, actually was created and even copyright itself, the first copyright act created in the United Kingdom uh, in the early uh, 18th century. Uh, these are things for which other re regimes have been developed, um, but they still intersect and even have gaps around um, kind of with the copyright and intellectual property regime, which is why there's these little stars beside them. Um, if they're old enough or if they predate IP laws, quite often they're thought to be in the public domain and available for everyone to use because of the copyright uh, term. But it doesn't mean that they are because there could be national laws or there could be um, international treaties or different ways of making sure that these uh, subject matter, these materials are not subjected to wealth uh, and knowledge extraction. Um, so it's something to keep in mind there. But then we also have, an we have materials for which intellectual property rights have expired. Um, so these are creative works for which the author has died more than 70 years ago. Again, faithful reproductions of these works. And then we start to get into the traditional knowledge, traditional cultural heritage and intangible cultural heritage territory. Um, and then things that have been dedicated to the public domain. So maybe rights arise, but people have said, you know what, we're just gonna pass these over and um, everyone can use them for whatever purpose. Um, so this is kind of, you know, part of the problematic uh, areas that, that then start to intersect with museum um, management because 
when we're thinking about even in the terms of copyright and considering how long that is and thinking about what we can make available online and available for reuse, um, it naturally means that we have to go back to collections that were created and the author died more than 70 years ago, which gets pretty pale, male and stale. Um, with archival materials, we then start to think about, even though these things are in the copyright public domain, are there other issues like privacy, identity, and ethical concerns about making these things available online? And, you know, plus not all heritage institutions have signed on to the premise that public domain works should remain in the public domain following digitization. So even that claim of a new right and the commercialization of that reproduction uh, can raise some ethical issues depending on uh, the, the work that we're talking about. Um, but, you know, with many digital collections, the result is that, you know, we have um, open access collections or things that are online because they're typically seen as unproblematic. And that results in paintings, drawings, and other typically male expressions um, that are, you know, in the public domain and potentially as are their reproductions rather than expressions by women and people of color that may have been categorized as craft or antiquities, and even for whom the creator or the information uh, may not have been recorded either upon you know, the purchase or the, the acquisition of the work by an individual and it, it going into the museum collection. So these sorts of things um, then start to kind of populate and show absence or silence within front end collections and thinking about how that impacts public perceptions um, through, through a lot of the things that we've been talking about. Um, there are a number of studies that are actually looking at data in really innovative ways for research purposes and even thinking about institutional ethnographies and all of these decisions that mediate um, how histories become present, uh, curation, classification, cataloging cultural and heritage and even information. And um, some of these, of course, are looking at uh, individual institutional practices like this book Cataloging Culture, um, as well as some of the reductive practices in trying to um, categorize things in a way that may not uh, especially um, reflect the, the actual history of the object and the ownership and um, the way in which it was acquired. Um, but because of these, you know, situated selection processes and because they often get transferred into technology systems and infrastructures on the front end, which then become aggregated when we think about searching the collections and the digital collections, um, we quite literally receive empirical evidence about what was important to collect, document, and record around a given culture. And these things can be really important to study and understand um, around the ethnologies of collections management and curation bias and even uh, data bias within an institution. But um, they might also have really significant impacts on public perceptions when we're thinking about um, what the collection represents, whether it seemed to be exhaustive, universal, global, or representing um, a specific uh, perception, even with respect to an individual item. So I'm just going to quickly show you this image and then cover it up because um, one of the things that we want to be keeping in mind is that we as heritage institutions set standards for the general public and that includes how we interpret law and produce things on the front end. Um, and one example of this, of course, is um, this carving, which was returned to Kenya by the Denver Museum. And of course, online, there is an image that's used by the museum. It says copyright uh, Denver Museum right underneath it. So one of the reasons that the opinion was to return this is because, you know, the carving itself is seen as an individual soul. And um, the curator is saying we shouldn't be curating people's souls, but should we also be digitizing and commercializing them? You know, this is another thing that casually kind of exports when we're thinking about how digital has become so central to collections management um, and also museum operations that we need to be critically thinking about with respect to everything that Matilde um, addressed, you know, just before me, especially because quite often these things that become normalized and part of popular culture can become um, what is seen to be as objectively problematic, but can be incredibly problematic when we think about the meanings that associate um, with the visual representations, how they become used, and how museums play an important part in that. Um, so I'm just going to end there and uh, leave up just a little bit of a slide about some of the work that Matilda and I have been doing around this.
Um, we're happy to share these links in the chat uh, immediately afterward. We're really thinking about what's happening with digital and how law is mediating a lot of these decisions and even replicating things um, in digital environments. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. There was so much information in there. Um, I'm glad we're recording this. Um, uh, I can't see myself at the moment, which always makes me go a bit funny, but thank you both. I love the optimism again, Matilda. Everyone's very cheerful here today when I thought this was going to be a session that was much closer to um, moaning on, really. But what I, <laughs> and, and thank you, Andrea, for your, your concise romp through what's going on and again the idea of it being optimistic i love the reframing that you're producing and i want you to write this up and give me a toolkit please and i think the whole sector would be delighted what i did hear and what we haven't actually addressed is um that this is partly a call to arms in some ways and that when matilda talks about shaping practice we are sort of thinking about what the next steps might be so examining practice in relation to their framing in which we think of public domain we think about use we look at our exploitative standard practices we address our anxiety in a brave um, but well informed and um, not quite sure how, but this was meant to sort of originally be a sort of first call out to this because I think we all observe um, a lot of anxiety. I mean, it was originally we had a title that was something like the pseudo legality, the pseudo legalities of museum myth making or something. Um, and, it, it, and it is about the sort of not quite understanding what's going on and oddness in practice when we're trying actually to be as open and turn turn this thing on its head so with 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 jc's sort of inverting practice again and starting with people and you're looking at you know what we can do openly rather than what we can't do as a starting point i think i think it's a really quite surprisingly ungrim session <laughs> we're at full of, full of positivity <laughs> um i think it'd be fantastic if you could put all the links did you do that already um and I, yeah, I wonder if when we put this up on, on the video, Colin, we could we could also capture some of these things and all of the projects as links, because I think JC's work should be here as well. 